Hello, sisters. Welcome to the Sacred Medicine Podcast, weaving powerful, soulful practices into functional medicine. Step into this beautiful space of devotion and explore everything from nurturing foods, rituals, sexuality, and awakening your innate sensuality. It is time to own your radiance. This is the Sacred Medicine Podcast. Hello and welcome back to another week of the Sacred Medicine Podcast. I am your host, Margaret Romero, and today we have Stephanie Reinold. She is a board-certified psychiatrist, maternal mental health expert, and founder of the Not the Typical Mom blog and podcast about the not-so-typical but all-too-common issues of motherhood. She helps high-achieving moms escape the stereotypes, find their hearts, and embrace who they really are so they can kill it in their life, love, and business. So such an interesting conversation today, talking all about moms, postpartum depression, what to do. And since this is not a topic that I can easily talk about only because I have never been a mother, Um, I needed to have her on so we can talk about this topic, which I feel is super important. And she also says it's an epidemic that is growing out of proportion, that there are a growing number of women who are suffering from postpartum depression. And so we talk all about some of the symptoms. They vary in, you know, from angry to depress and everything in between. So we talk about some of the symptoms and some of the simple things that you can do before getting on medication. And we also talk about if you needed to be on medication, what are some of the different forms of medication you can be on? And we also talked about some of the things that we see vitamin wise postpartum that I have actually seen as well in my practice of women who have just given birth, um, for the most part are somewhat moderately, if not severely vitamin and nutrient deficient. So we talk about some of these things that we've common, that we've commonly seen and some of the easy things that you can do to not only get them checked, but to remedy some of these deficiencies. Now it's not hard to remedy a vitamin deficiency, um, it's just a matter of knowing what it is and having a practitioner that's going to be testing the right things. So that is it for this week. I hope you enjoy this conversation and I hope you learn a lot just like I did. Now on to the show. And today's special guest is Stephanie Reinold. Thank you so much for being on the show today, Stephanie. Thank you so much for having me. So we are going to be talking all about um, new moms and talking about mental health in um, maybe not new moms or all moms in general. Now, this is a topic that I have not talked about on the podcast as of yet. I am not a mother. And so this is all new sort of information since I can't sort of speak about it um, on first term basis. You know, I've never gone through childbirth or having a child at all. So would love to hear more about this topic. I think it affects more women than we think. And being in the healthcare industry, it's definitely something that you know, we're going to talk more about this, but I think it's definitely something that may be ignored or or not fully understood. So uh, thanks for being on the show today. Yeah, thank you. So let's start a little bit with um, what we commonly see um, with mental health when we talk about mental health um, and mothers. Um, Can we just dive? Do you have any stats or any sort of... um, age ranges or first time moms or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think just as you're hearing you speak, I want to make a distinction, you know, cause you are a functional medicine doctor and I respect that. And there is a distinct difference between mental health and mental illness. And, you know, in, I think the terms sort of get lumped 
into one thing. And, but I really say, you know, I do treat mental illnesses as a psychiatrist, but really my overall goal is that we all are focusing more on our mental health because I think mental health at large is this big umbrella, really meaning like our emotional health, like our heart and soul health that we totally never talk about, never talk about. And especially moms, you know, once you have a child and your whole life is kind of sacrificing yourself to your family and your child. And it's almost rewarded that kind of behavior to sacrifice who you are. And so I just want to make that kind of clear distinction that as we go into talking about mental illnesses, that, you know, whether or not you ever struggle with, you know, a diagnosable mental illness or not, these concepts that I talk about are relatable to anybody because a lot of even the treatment that I get into, you know, outside of just, you know, medications or specific kinds of therapy, like the goal is really to prioritize yourself and to really uncover what self-care means to that individual mom. Because I think that's really at the root of a lot of issues that I see is just that really like they have been abandoning their mental health, like their soul health for so long that they, you know, quote unquote, lose themselves after they become moms. And it's really this really peak period where we can actually see clinical diagnosable mental illnesses. And yet what you see is like maybe decades before that, they've slowly been dying a slow death because we just don't prioritize this as a culture, as a society at large. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, in terms of statistics, you know, specifically postpartum and depression, you know, the conservative estimates say it's anywhere from 10 to 15 percent diagnosis. More liberal estimates are upwards of 30 to 40 percent even. So I think I always say it's about one in five. And that's kind of the statistic that we talk about, which is a huge statistic, by the way. I mean, it is the most common complication of childbirth. I mean, more than gestational diabetes, more than postpartum hemorrhage, more than any sort of medical complications, more than preterm deliveries. I mean, this is a huge epidemic. You know, part of my background is I have a master's in public health, and this is a true public health crisis. And it's really unfortunate because I feel like the information that's out there in terms of pop culture or what you see in the media is what I would consider a very rare form of postpartum depression. And so that's like seeing women that kill their babies or women that quote unquote go crazy or, um, you know, are having really severe disturbing thoughts of like harming themselves or harming their babies. And I, I must say like in clinical practice in, you know, even statistically speaking, that is like maybe one to 5% of like overall cases. And in fact, it's not actually even considered postpartum depression at the point you're having, you know, hallucinations or really disturbing thoughts. You know, that's more borderline on what we call postpartum psychosis, which is a true medical emergency, you know, something that needs emergent medical care. And so I feel like postpartum depression in the very common forms that it's seen, women think that it's just normal. You know, and I can speak. Um, so my daughter is five, and you know, part of my professional experience is informed by my own personal experience with having postpartum depression after my first child is born, my daughter, and that is what I thought. I just thought this is normal. I'm I'm supposed to be really tired. I'm supposed to be, you know depressed. Like I'm supposed to have no energy. I'm supposed to be a little foggy in my brain. And, and so it takes so long for women to finally get help because usually it is by that point manifested itself into, um, a much more severe form where you are having those intrusive thoughts and you are having, um, you know, just really concerning symptoms that are affecting, you know, your daily ability to function in life. But I mean, most postpartum depression, is much more minor than that. And the sooner that you can acknowledge those symptoms, the sooner that you can get treatment. Um, You asked about, you know, first time moms, and it would stand to reason that first time moms would have a higher percentage of postpartum depression, because it's a new experience. And, you know, anything that's new would come as sort of a shock to sort of our psyche a little bit more. But actually, there is no clinically significant or statistically significant difference in your first child to your third or fourth child. Um, I've seen women that didn't get postpartum depression until their third baby. I've seen women that got it for their first three kids and not for subsequent pregnancies um, and everything in between. I've seen a woman, she had it after her first baby and then not after her second and then after her third. And so it's, Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. 
So it really, there's a little bit no rhyme or reason to it. I will say after you've had one episode of postpartum depression, you are much higher risk for a subsequent postpartum depression after subsequent children, um, especially if it was untreated. So that's probably most common too. Like the first time around, you don't get treatment. And then once you get pregnant again, you're very fearful of going through that similar experience again. And so then that's when women come to see me because they, they want to, you know, either prevent a postpartum depression or they, um, they're really concerned. They want to prepare better the second time around. So that's just a little kind of overview of the, um, statistics for you, if that's helpful. Yeah, great. And let's talk about, um, about the symptoms too. What are women experiencing? What are they feeling? What's the most common things? Well, it is very different from woman to woman, but I mean, obviously paramount is a change in your mood. And so again, it comes, it's very difficult, right? Because if, you know, what is normal, you know, what is not normal? And I, I tell women, it's kind of like, you sort of know yourself. And so if you think of, if you've never had a baby before, so if this is your first child, think of how you have responded to stressors in the past. And if this is out of proportion to that, then that's a red flag. So, and turn in terms of like the changes of mood, you know, some women are very clinically depressed, meaning like they are more tearful. um, They are very sad. Like they, you know, don't, they have a very difficult time actually smiling or laughing or finding joy and pleasure. Whereas a flip side, some women are more angry and you'll see irritability or just um, short temper or getting very hypersensitive to things. And so you see a little bit of fluctuations of both of those. Another common symptom, and again, this is very common with most postpartum women regardless, but you'll see fatigue. And it usually is out of proportion to a normal level of tiredness. And a big hallmark to this is even if you are getting sleep. So if you're only getting like two, three hours of sleep at night, I mean, all bets are off. Our first goal is to just get you more sleep. But if you're getting, I would say at least six to seven hours in a 24 hour period as a new mom, and you still are feeling overwhelming amounts of fatigue, like you just, it is really physically difficult for you to get through a day. That is really concerning. Um, you also will probably just feel like your brain is moving a lot slower. This is a huge symptom for me. So, you know, I went back to work, you know, I was a working mom and, you know, clinically speaking, it was just taking me a lot longer to finish my tasks than normal. And I was making kind of careless errors. And I just felt like, I just felt like I wasn't on my game, you know, and it, was at the point where my daughter was sleeping through the night, you know, sleep necessarily wasn't a problem, but I was still feeling so much lack of energy. Um, also a really clinical feature is if you are having a difficult time sleeping, even when the baby is sleeping, that is really concerning because that usually means that there's some kind of anxiety at play or, um, there's probably a lot of worries and concerns that are, um, affecting your ability to mother, Other things are just like really not being able to do things that you, you know, quote unquote, should be doing. Um, So if you're having like really concerning worries or um, just things like, like I had a a patient just recently, like she wasn't giving her baby a bath at night because she had this overwhelming fear that her baby was going to drown. And there was no real kind of basis in reality. Like she just was so fearful and had so much anxiety around that particular act that it was her husband that was giving her baby a bath because she just could not do it. Um, If you are feeling like just really detached and this could be not necessarily from your baby itself, although definitely like if you're feeling like, um, like you are detached from your baby, you know, like you aren't quite bonding, like you feel like you should, or maybe detached even from your husband or other relationships in your life. Um, For me, it actually came up in my job. You know, I'm a career woman. I love my career. I love my job. And I was feeling this like detachment from my job and just kind of an overall like numbness to life. Mm. Um, Some people, some people just kind of describe it like they, like they feel like a ghost. Like they're just kind of going through life without a lot of emotion, just with this like overall numbness. Um, That's kind of some of the classic stuff I see. Got it. And what are some of the things that you do to help the women? I mean, do they have to go on medication? Is that one of the first things or um, what what are some of the first things that you do to help these women? I think the utmost, most important thing is sleep. 
for any new mom. And with that actually comes a lot of nuanced conversations, actually, because a lot of times women either aren't sleeping because they're exclusively breastfeeding and maybe having a difficult time with it. So they're pumping extra and then having a lot of guilt and shame because they're not, you know, feeding their baby appropriately. And so we have to you know, we have to uncover the reasons like why they're not sleeping. So is it because they don't have enough support? Is it because they're not breastfeeding very well and maybe they need to give up breastfeeding or they need to drop a feeding and let their husband help out, you know, more? And so just getting more sleep is actually a really long, lengthy conversation for a new mom because as I mentioned in the beginning of this conversation, you know, it's it's the natural thing for us moms and and women in general, for us to kind of sacrifice ourselves, you know, we have this sort of martyr complex that we're allowed to suffer, but, you know, not at the expense of other people. And so I see that play out so much. So if I am talking about sleep, you know, like we really need to prioritize your sleep. We really need to make sure that you're resting because, you know, your body needs rest, but our brain needs rest postpartum too. I mean, your hormones are all over the place. And they're really trying to balance themselves out. And so if you're not resting and giving your body that space, you know, the the biggest things I see is like immediately they're jumping back to like their, you know, boot camp routines and they're not sleeping and they're, you know, trying to get their body back and they're dieting and they're just expending so much energy from their body and never actually resting Mm. their body or their brain. So that's actually before we ever talk about medications, I want to make sure that they are actually resting for themselves. Okay. And that's a great point. Great point. Now I know that if they are, so what happens when they're so, they just want to breastfeed for even a good nine to 12 months. And that's mm-hmm. the one thing that's keeping them up, you know, in the middle of the night many mm-hmm. times. Um, and they really don't want to give it up, but they really need to sleep. I mean, I would think that a lot of women sort of have this inner conflict. It's very hard. It's and it's a, a completely individual decision. And I I would never be someone to say, you know, you absolutely should stop breastfeeding or you absolutely need to breastfeed. You know, um, I just kind of help guide the decision making process. So for some women, you're absolutely right. It is the one thing that's actually going well for them. You know, like they maybe don't feel that connected to their baby, but they're actually breastfeeding and that's going well. And so I say, absolutely continue that. So then what are other things that we can, maybe while your baby's sleeping, you need to get it, you know, someone to help out with the chores around the house that you can rest yourself. Um, you know, on the flip side, if it's a woman that really is struggling and it's a personal kind of guilt complex that they are putting on themselves, like I, I have to breastfeed even though maybe they're not making enough milk or it's really affecting their emotional mental health. You know, I, I try to have a multidisciplinary approach. So I get other people involved in the care. So it's not just me. So it's, you know, if she has a lactation consultant on board, you know, we all kind of have a conversation, um, her husband or partner who's helping her. And really it comes down to like, what is truly best for you? You know, if it's maybe you need to pump extra in the morning so that your husband can have that bottle at nighttime and it's one less feeding that you're waking up for, or maybe it's cutting out nighttime feedings altogether, you know, specifically for women that have a history of bipolar or they do have a more severe history of depression, even before babies, that's probably when I get a little bit more paternalistic because it truly is much higher risk for them to continue to have lack of sleep because of breastfeeding than any potential benefit the baby is going to get. Because I will say there's significant evidence that shows that untreated depression or anxiety in pregnancy or postpartum has very severe effects to the baby. So it's although counterintuitive that, you know, if I continue breastfeeding, if I continue like sacrificing myself to the baby, then everything's going to be fine for the baby. And then I'm the only one suffering, but it's not true. Actually, you know, the baby has long-term effects from that, um, that they've now studied. What are they seeing in the baby? So uh, there's a really great study. And, um, I don't know if you can link up to in the show notes. I'm trying to think of the name. It's, um, a researcher out of Harvard, I believe, but he did an experiment on babies. And this was years ago. Gosh, the video is pretty old. It's from the nineties. It's called, I think it's called the still face experiment and you can Google it on YouTube and it'll come up. Um, and it's basically a woman and they, this was before they've done like now 
retrospective data from like European and Canadian studies because in the United States, we don't keep that kind of data about babies and mothers, but they do in other countries and they've looked at that. But before all of this, that sort of instigated these looking at this was this study called the still face experiment. And it was, they brought a woman into a room and they sat a baby down and the baby, I think was maybe like three, four months old. And they put him in kind of like a car seat sort of thing. And, um, the mom, Originally, so they started the study and the mom was just interacting with the baby and, you know, like ooing and eyeing and smiling and the baby was interacting and it was great. And then the mom turns away, looks back and has no expression. So like not smiling, barely making eye contact, no interaction with the baby. And you, what you see at the manifestation in the baby is so profound because the baby starts posturing and crying and screaming and in like seconds, I mean, this is like within seconds that the baby starts becoming so physically uncomfortable. And so Mm. from this theory, they were concerned that if this is going on for months, you know, if this is affecting maybe not every single second of every single day, but if you have moments where you're not interacting with your child, you're not showing expression on your face, you know, you really are clinically depressed, which is often part of the manifestations of depression, you're not bonding with your baby one can only assume that if small ter- small doses of that is creating this level of distress in a baby, then it creates the same level of st- like increased stress hormones within the baby and then all of the medical and um, psychological complications that come with that. So it's anywhere from just learning disabilities that they've shown like later on to um, just behavior disorders or just like poor bonding from a young age. Um, And so there are like some very real effects. Now in pregnancy, it's a little different because most of the effects are in terms of um, higher risks of preterm labor, more complications at delivery, um, obviously higher risk for maternal postpartum depression, um, and in the baby, like lower birth weight. And you see the similar effects as smoking, actually, which is really interesting because it's basically an increase. If you think of depression from an inflammatory model, which is one of the theories that it is sort of an over-inflammation or like an overactivity of immune markers in our body, then it makes sense that your baby is now being raised, you know, while you're still pregnant in this very stressful environment. So then you have a lot of similar effects as if you were smoking in pregnancy. Mm. So interesting. I love that study. Yeah. Yeah, And I can see how if a mother is detached or she's just really not responding or bonding to the baby, how these could just cause months and months and months of the baby just being irritable and crying and just, and, and then therefore making the whole situation even worse for the mother. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It is like this catch 22. It's so hard because sometimes it's like, what came first, the chicken or the egg? Because sometimes these women do have really fussy, colicky babies to begin with, and they're not sleeping and they're feeling like a horrible mom because they can't calm or soothe their baby And then it manifests itself in postpartum depression. And then it's making everything worse because they're not bonding. And then the baby's continuing. So, and that's not always the case either. You know, I'll say even from my personal experience, my baby was a great sleeper. You know, we didn't have problems with breastfeeding. She, you know, I didn't have those risk factors in particular that, you know, maybe were sort of a cause for my postpartum depression. Um, But that kind of goes to show you too, you don't need, you don't need to have a fussy baby. You don't need to be not sleeping. Like postpartum depression truly is a clinical diagnosis that some women get and some women don't. And it, there are some risk factors for it. And there's some, certainly some things that can increase after, you know, even postpartum can increase your risks and, you know, manifest itself. But by and large, I mean, there are, It can affect women from all walks of life. It can affect people from all ages, you know, as I mentioned before, first time moms or third or fourth time moms. And it doesn't really, does it matter the age? Like if if it was a a really young mom, let's say early 20s versus a mother who is mid 40s, let's say, or early 40s? You know, you would think, right? Um, And again, it really some of this data is going to be a little bit skewed because the data comes from women who are seeking help because we can't, you know, make up 
information from people if they're not actually seeking services. True. So we know that if you are an older mom and say from a higher socioeconomic status, you're probably more likely to seek services. So it's where some of the data can be a little bit skewed because if more women who are suffering at older ages or in higher income brackets are seeking help, then maybe it lends itself to, you know, that is actually a lower percentage. Whereas, um, to just clarify it, you know, so the data shows that there's no difference. However, if, you know, what I'm saying, like maybe younger populations don't seek help as much, or, you know, people from lower socioeconomic statuses don't seek help as much, maybe there actually is a higher percentage of those populations that do suffer, but because they're not seeking services, they aren't actually included in the data sets, if that makes sense. Yeah, totally, totally. Okay, so now, would you say that the majority of women um, eventually need to get on some kind of medication or, or or do you just see that across the board just it's very different um, for I, I mean obviously it's different for every individual woman but the majority of women are they needing medication overall would you say I would say the majority of women if it is affecting your daily functioning will benefit from medication um, now all that to say, most of these women, this is their first time ever seeking mental health services. So even if you had a history of depression or anxiety, most of these women are really high fun. You know, most of us, most moms are really high functioning people. And so they probably just sort of pushed through it or got through it and just thought, oh, that was just a hard time, you know. Mm -hmm. But usually when I'm seeing someone, it's the first interaction they've ever had with a mental health professional because at this point, it's not only affecting them, but it's affecting their family, the whole family unit. And so I think they sort of finally piece it together. Like I can't, I can't suffer anymore for the sake of my child. And so usually, I mean, women, when they're seeing me, I mean, I am a psychiatrist, so I do prescribe medications as part of, you know, the treatment that I provide. And so usually they're wanting a faster response because it's, you know, it's a postpartum woman. We're dealing with like taking care of a baby and they want a more quick response. And so medication is usually part of that treatment because medications are going to work faster than, you know, other, you know, more natural approaches or um, more therapeutic approaches. And so I would say probably generally, yes, but you know, there's definitely people that are, um, you know, I respect their wishes if they really absolutely don't want pharmaceutical treatment. We look at some more natural remedies or over the counter treatments, um, just more like lifestyle changes. I mean, I'm telling you, even the sleep piece alone is sometimes enough for women to be like, oh, now, I, now I'm feeling better. <laughs> right. And is there a medication of choice that is safe and reliable that you've seen over and over again? Most antidepressants are, I would say. I mean, the, the big one that's been mostly studied is Zoloft, and that's kind of predominantly in the OBGYN field. Um, you know, if you see your, OB- so usually I would say they open up to their OBGYN first because it's probably the first or only provider that they have an interaction with. And that's usually their kind of drug of choice from that field. Um, in my stance, I think all of those medications. So, you know, other ones, if you've heard of them is like, um, Celexa or Prozac or Lexapro, um, even Wellbutrin or, you know, Cymbalta, effects are all of the antidepressant family Mm -hmm. tends to be equal efficacy for postpartum depression. Oh, okay. Okay. So you haven't really seen one working really so much better than another. I think it's by individual. Um, And it usually, I will say on average, takes probably one or two treatments, you know, um, and it comes down to really the side effect profile. Um, So for some of the medications cause like sexual side effects, and that can be concerning to patients. And so we'll try a medication with less sexual side effects, for instance, or some people have changes like in their appetite or even possibly weight gain, um, although not common. But if that's a concern, then we, you know, try something else. Um, That's, yeah, I don't think, you know, the big study is called the STAR-D study that came out a few years ago, and it looked at this was just for general depression, but I think it can be assumed for postpartum depression as well, that all antidepressants have equal efficacy in treating a mild to moderate depression. Um, But it's just really in terms of what's right for that individual patient. I'll also add, 
so many women and they've done, there's clinical studies, there's anecdotal studies, there's case studies that uh, having thyroid disease or having positive antibodies to thyroid postpartum is directly correlated with postpartum depression symptoms. And so part of my practice is I always check for thyroid and and a full thyroid panel because sometimes you don't just see it in getting, you know, what's the run of the mill study, which is called a TSH. Right. Um, you don't just see it from like that one value. Like sometimes it really takes like the full profile. And so usually it can be I'll start start like an antidepressant with augmenting thyroid hormone, for instance, and then the goal would be to slowly, you know, come off of one or even both in the future, um, if that's what you know their needs are. Oh, that's interesting. I've never heard the correlation there, but it totally makes sense. Yeah. Well, if you yeah, I mean, if you think about it, the childbearing years are this ripe time for so many autoimmune conditions, you know, like lupus onsets then, thyroid disease onsets then. We see rheumatoid arthritis and fibromyalgia and um, a lot of GI conditions and so many autoimmune diseases that the thinking is around the childbearing years or even in pregnancy postpartum that there is a distinct change in your immunology of your body, you know, immunology being like your immune system, like what's keeping you healthy. And it makes sense because so within pregnancy, just a little bio 101 for you guys, your immune system as a as the mom has to be suppressed so that you don't fight off the baby necessarily, right? right? So it's why a lot of pregnant women will get kind of colds more often or you know, they get more allergies or things like that because our immune system is a lot lower and it's also why pregnant women are higher risk for things like the flu or, you know, other things that are not as severe in a regular healthy, you know, 20, 30 something woman, but in a pregnant woman, it would be because their immune system is a lot lower. So then what happens postpartum is your immune system is trying to recalibrate itself because you now don't have a baby Mm -hmm. to care for and nourish. And so it makes sense. I mean, this is why kind of the immunology sort of theory or the inflammation theory of postpartum depression makes the most sense to me right now. You know, it's kind of the newest model out there for what causes postpartum depression because it is kind of a disarray of your immune system. And we know that that can affect your brain. Mm, Totally, totally. And so is this, would you say that this is, that women need to have um, some form of thyroid dysfunction prior to getting pregnant? And then it just sort of worsens, obviously, during pregnancy? I don't know about that. That's interesting. I mean, I am not a thyroidologist or endocrinologist by any means. Um, there is a huge correlation, obviously, with postpartum depression and hormones. So I've you know, done my research and I keep up to date on most things I can in that age group. But um, in terms of like when did the thyroid disease actually onset, um, I don't know. I don't, I don't know that. Okay. Okay. And then what about what, what I've seen a lot as well and her have heard and read a lot of is in postpartum moms, they will have lots of, um, somewhat significant vitamin deficiencies at times leading to feeling of, of not only fatigue, but sometimes feeling, um, the depression or having, like you said, the hormone hormone issues, like that's a pretty big thing. And I, I don't think that a lot of moms are getting a nutritional um, lab work done. Have you seen that? Do you see this often or not? Oh, so much? absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and, you know, we learn in like, you know, our OBGYN clinicals, like you, you as the mom, okay, let me back up. The baby will never be lacking in nutrients because it is the baby's job throughout pregnancy to basically suck off of the woman's reserves. Yeah. So it's why, you know, a baby is not going to be anemic. Like a baby's not going to have low iron because they're going to suck everything from the mom. But the mom could very well be anemic and have right. low iron. You know, the mom could have so iron is huge postpartum because you you also have you so you have low iron probably going into birth because throughout your pregnancy, the baby's sucking from your iron reserves, but then also you lose a lot of blood throughout, you know, having the baby through delivery. 
So iron is huge coming back to normal and it takes up to 90 days for iron to fully recalibrate. And if those first three months you're also not, you know, eating as well or you're dieting, my God, if you're dieting, please stop. But like if you're not like eating enough calories to actually like replenish those nutrients like from a natural way, like your body's gonna have a really hard time to build up that reserve. You know, the other one's vitamin D, like you'll see, although this hasn't been correlated, um, that, you know, like winter births are more likely to have postpartum depression that, that hasn't been out there, but I see it clinically just anecdotally, it does tend to be a little more common. And I think it's because of probably a more vitamin D deficiency and also just the social factors of being more isolated and indoors in the winter months. Right. And so, but I think it's year round, you know, if you're not leaving your house, you know, you're not getting outside and you already have low vitamin D from your pregnancy and then postpartum, you're not actually, ex you know, exposed to the sun or you're not taking any supplements. Um, you know, that's a really huge one. The thyroid is really huge. Um, the other one is magnesium that people don't talk about, but magnesium is sort of the natural, um, like anxiety anxiety decreasing sort of mineral, if you think about yeah. it. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, postpartum women, I think, need a lot higher doses of that because it's just so easily, you know, expelled from the body. Um, those are kind of the big ones. But yeah, I mean, most women, especially if they're breastfeeding, but even any postpartum woman should be on a prenatal vitamin still. And that's like a bare minimum in terms of nutrition, I think. But and especially just eating enough food, you know, that, like I said, I mean, that is just, uh, our society is just a little crazy with kind of getting the pre-baby body back that women just usually don't understand that you actually do need to be eating like a fair amount of calories in your system to not only withstand breastfeeding and like nurturing your baby, but also to heal your own reserves. You know, I once heard it takes about three years before you have a baby for you to develop enough reserves to um, care for and nurture that baby's, like all the nutrients throughout childbirth. And if you think about then, that would stand to reason then after you have a baby, it would probably take at least three years to build that back up. And most women, you know, have a baby soon after that, or their babies are very close together. And so, especially if it's a subsequent pregnancy, those nutrition factors are even more important because they probably have never really built up their reserve again from a nutritional standpoint. Right, right. And going back to what you were saying about the magnesium, this is so true because uh, most individuals are magnesium deficient. And so they're, and with low, ma low levels of magnesium, you get lots of, um, it is, it's the calming sort of a mineral. And so if there's constipation, magnesium works great. If there's mm -hmm. um, muscle cramping, it's usually um, a magnesium deficiency. So we see that so much. I think people in general should just be on magnesium. It's also good for, um, I think I just read a study about magnesium and with brain health. Oh, yeah. I mean... And honestly, you, you can't overdose on it. I mean, the worst it's going to give you is some diarrhea. So, right, right. I mean, magnesium is a pretty safe thing that probably most people should be on. I agree with you. Yes, totally. Oh, my gosh. This is so great. Um, any last things that we did not talk about that you feel are really is really important for any moms listening? Just, yeah, I guess I just really want to hammer home that – when you put yourself first, when you actually prioritize your own health, your own sanity, your own mental health, it truly is revolutionary for not only you, but your your life, like your relationships, your family unit. I mean, you know, the the old adage is like, if, if mama ain't happy, nobody happy, but it's true. It really, like I see it like clinically and, and with my friends and, and it's such a really easy thing to say out loud and a really, really difficult thing to put into practice that it really requires you to put yourself first. Because as I've said a few times in this interview, it is so natural for us to sacrifice ourselves. You know, you hear those, the stories like from, ages beyond that, you know, a woman died for her kids and sacrificed herself for her children. And so we think that that's normal and it's really doing your whole family a disservice and especially your kids 
Because when you can work on yourself, and that's not only in postpartum, that's beyond. That is, when you can prioritize yourself, you are that much better to be a mom for everyone else, to be a friend, to be a wife, like whatever your role is. Mm, Thank you for adding that. So how can people find you and if they wanted to work with you or uh, learn more about you? Yeah. So my online platform is not the typical mom.com. And so I, I have a podcast and, um, lots of goodies and information there that you can find me. If you want to, if you by chance live in the state of Virginia or live in Texas or know somebody who does, and you're interested in kind of more individual services, you can go to my main page, stephanierinoldmd.com. Those are probably the best places to find me right now. Great. And do you do phone consults, but only for individuals who live in either one of those states? So if it's going to be psychiatric services, like prescribing medications, I'm only licensed in those states. If it's more coaching or education, consulting, kind of things like that, I do that nationwide virtually, yes. Oh, great, great. Okay, that's yeah. great. And then your podcast is called Not the Typical Mom? Yeah, Not the Typical Mom Show, yeah. Okay, great. I'm going to... Add all of this to the show notes. And I'm also going to put, try to find that article about the the research study, the still face. Is that what it's called? The still face experiment? Still face. Yeah. If you search that on YouTube, it'll come up. Yeah. It's really fascinating. All right. Well, Stephanie, thank you so much. This has been really eye-opening for me and I learned so much and I'm sure my listeners are going to be, you know, if they have been experiencing any form of depression and haven't really said anything to anyone, maybe this will get them to know that they're not alone and to seek help. Um, where should they go? Where, where, what's a good, is it, is it a G1, their OBGYN? Who should they go to see? I think your OBGYN, if you like, if you know, like, and trust them. Um, some people don't. And so I'd say don't go there. Um, but honestly, even before that, just telling somebody is actually a really powerful thing. Like, because so many women keep this stuff kind of bottled inside. And so telling one person, which that first person might not be your doctor, it might be your mom or your spouse or your best friend. Like, but getting it out there and yeah, knowing that you're not alone. This is super common. I'll also add a really great resource uh, is Postpartum Support International and their webpage is postpartum.net and they have tons of resources and you can look up to see if they're, if they have a chapter in your area and they do lots of support groups and things and um, most of them are free too. So it's a really great, great. Um, maybe easy access. Yeah. Oh, perfect. Okay. I'll include that in the show notes as well. Stephanie, thank you so much. I so appreciate your time and we will speak soon. Yeah, thank you, Margaret. Well, I super hope that you enjoy this conversation. And if you find yourself suffering from postpartum depression or, you know, are a new mom and just really feeling not a connection, not feeling right and want to seek help, there is more information on the show note page. And you can also find it at margaretromero.com forward slash episode 79. And also to find out more about Stephanie and how she may be able to help you and resources from her, head on over to our show note page. Again, that's margaretromero.com forward slash episode 79. Hope you're having a beautiful day and I'll speak to you all next week. Much love and big hugs. Bye for now.